Okay. So good morning, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Brandon. I'm the Family Support Fellow at Penn's Family Resource Center. So I'd like to start by thanking our panelists for taking the time to join us today. And to thank those of you who are here to grapple with the thoughts posed in the title of today's event, Ask an Expert, Parenting in Uncertain Times. So these uncertain times couldn't be more true now as we await to see the results of the election and wonder when will all of this end. Um, the US election is foregrounded all the while COVID cases are increasing in many areas. Systemic racial injustice has become more salient in various spheres of our society and students at all levels must navigate virtual learning. All this at once is particularly overwhelming for families and raises many questions about how to best support our children and ourselves during these uncertain times. And so to answer some of these questions and to help us work through them, we have three experts with us today, Dr. Vivian L. Gadsden, Dr. Marcia Richardson, and Dr. Howard C. Stevenson. So uh, to give you all an idea of the format, so each panelist will give a brief presentation today um, and then after all of their presentations, we will open up the space for the questions. Okay, so um, first we're gonna have Dr. Vivian Gadsden. So Dr. Vivian Gadsden is the William T. Carter Professor of Child Development and Education Director of the National Center on Fathers and Families at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also on the faculties of Africana Studies and of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies and is faculty co-director of Penn Futures and faculty co-convener of the Penn's Ethnography and Education Research Forum. Dr. Gadsden's research and scholarly interests focus on learning and literacy among young children, parents and families across the life course, particularly those at the greatest risk for academic and social vulnerability. Nationally, Dr. Gadsden served as the chair of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicines Committee on supporting parents of young children. It was lead author of the committee's Bookland study, Parenting Matters. She's also co-editor in chief of Educational Researcher and the Review of Research in Education and has published over 100 journal articles, book chapters and bookland volumes, including books on literacy and African-American youth, incarcerated parents and the lives of children, families and communities and risk equity in schooling. Dr. Gatson is a former president of the American Education Research Association, Association and a member of the National Academy of Education. She earned her doctorate from the University of Michigan. So at this point, Dr. Gatson, I'll turn it over to you and I will start sharing your presentation. Dr. Gadsden, I don't think, I think you're muted. <laughs> I was saying so many brilliant things. Um, thank you, Brandon, that introduction um, probably covers everything I'm going to say <laughs> today. Um, thank you for this invitation and I wanna thank the Family Resource Center for simply existing and, the, and for doing the work that you do. I've been at Penn um, for 30 years. I came with some people that many of you know, um, among them, uh, Takuba Zuberi and Herman Beavers. I think of us when um, we were much younger. We all came very, very young, I must, must say. Um, Howard came a uh, few years later, and it's my pleasure to work with both Howard and Marcia. So it's a it is a delight to be a part of this um, panel today. Um, my research and work in the field has really kind of focused on learning and literacy and families. And particularly I'm focused on children and families exposed to educational and social vulnerability. And in this work, I focused on three broad swaths of work. The first is the reduction of risks that, risk that are created by um, systemic racism and structural barriers. A second is the effort to address educational and social inequality that puts poor and racially minoritized children and families at risk. And a third has been to create as much as I can opportunity that can support the possibilities among African-American children and families and other marginalized populations. We can go to the next one. Um, this is, I've been involved in several projects, but just to give you a sense of the kinds of projects that I've done, 
And I'm happy to talk about these either today or at any point by the email or on text or telephone. One is focused on early um, young children and families. Um, in particular, um, looking at what happens in families over different generations and the ways in which factors that affect families end up kind of defining who they are and creating what I have called family cultures, which is a theoretical framework I did. Um, my earliest work in Philadelphia was in Head Start, working with um, Puerto Rican and Black families in North Philadelphia. Um, a more recent project was one that I did with John Fantuzo focused on the uh, evidence-based program for the integration of curricula, combining looking at children's cognitive development and their social emotional development, working with teachers and families. A five generational study that I also did with families who moved from the rural South throughout the US. And a fourth one that focuses on fathers and families, on all fathers and families, but in particular, um, low income fathers and families. And then interestingly enough, a second body of work is really focused on children of incarcerated parents, fathers in particular. And this project was initially funded by the Department of Justice um, shortly after the Clinton administration. And we know that there were many issues around incarceration during the Clinton administration, but at the same time, there was this group of people who worked in that administration who were very focused on the effects of incarceration on children. And we are interviewing these, those children 10 years later, um, even as I speak. And then a community health and community literacies project that was at the Sayre Recreation Center. We had adults doing ethnographies of their own communities about the ways in which people kind of understand and take control of their health as well as their literacies. And then two projects that are, we are doing right now. One is a project focused on racial disproportionality and child welfare. Philadelphia has the highest um, rate of out of home placements um, of African-American children in the country. And we're working with the Department of Human Services. And then a fifth project is one that I'm working with adolescents. I'm very proud of myself working with adolescents. Um, we have about 25 or 30 children who, um, youth, students, um, who are um, doing community-based, culturally focused projects that are intended to support their communities. And this has been an extraordinary um, experience that I have had working with these students. And it reminds me of just how talented students are here in Philadelphia. And then we can have the next slide, um, Brandon. So what have, what have we learned? You know, so much of what we learn is probably what people already thought that at least we have some empirical evidence for some of it. Um, but first I would say that the question for me of what matters is the children's health, education and well-being is a, que is a question related to three matters. The first is for whom does it matter? And this work matters for children, families, and communities. All of us are working in tandem to provide the best circumstances for children and families. The second is when does it matter? And it matters from the time children are born. You might remember in the early part of 2000, there were studies on the brain and neuroscience. And we know that children's brains are developing at birth. And so that initial experience runs through the life course. And then how does it matter? It matters at all times. It matters in, at every critical point and in every context possible. We can get the next one, um, Brandon, please. And then um, I was thinking about why we must be vigilant about children's learning and how we make what we're doing matter. We know that at the moment of birth, children rely on their parents. They rely on their parents even when other people are going to take care of them. In other words, they rely on their parents to determine who in the sphere of influence will have an effect on them. And every point in their lives will matter because competence begets competence as um, folks have often, have often said. In addition, um, I identify kind of four areas in the next slide um, that I took from the report that we did at the National Academies of Sciences. And these are things that we all know. Um, that to ensure um, children's healthy development and reduce risk, um, 
we want to support parents in kind of four broad areas. And that is in assuring children's physical health and safety. This has to do with the ways in which we protect is why we are careful about the neighborhoods that we move in um, into. And we worry when people are not able to get the supports that they need in various neighborhoods and, and communities. We are concerned about children's emotional and behavioral competence, um, the degree to which um, they are prepared to handle difficult situations like the one we're in. Um, my husband and I just um, had our own trauma because we couldn't give out candy at Halloween. I think we were more upset than the children, but it's a stressful period in, in, in all dimensions of children's lives. And I think this is this pandemic as well as um, the social unrest um, have both uncovered so many problems um, that we took for granted um, or that we ignored, I should say. Um, and so just as, as I tell my um, doctoral students when we are concerned about the youth in our project, I said, they're living in the same world that we're living in. And so they're struggling with some of the same um, issues and ensuring their social competence so they can get along with their peers so they can get along with others in, in, in their world. And lastly, um, their cognitive competence, the degree to which um, they are able to bring and build their capacities to learn and to succeed in school. And then lastly, um, in the last um, slide, um, what do parents and families need um, to ensure their children's health and well-being? And this is not an exhaustive list. There are many other factors, but the first is their own commitment to their children's well-being and an opportunity to support them, to use the knowledge that they bring. Parents and families bring an enormous amount of knowledge and that combined with more formal knowledge will be successful. I do not know many parents who are, who are not committed to their children, even if they don't have all the resources. Um, and we need to build on that care and that commitment. And then secondly, um, we need systems that work, not systems that attempt to work, but systems that work, that are aware and that are responsive to the diversity of children and families who are a part of our um, society and our communities. We also need institutions that can help parents and families navigate parenting and navigate the demands of parents. Um, folks who are struggling now to teach children, I see my colleague and friend Tamika um, Easley who's in my division and I know she is teaching her beautiful son um, and working and, and getting phone calls from me as I push her to the edge. Um, but people are, are really trying to navigate so many different demands. And then lastly, we need flexible schools and teachers and other systems that can accommodate the constraints that parents have. The fact that um, parents simply don't have all the time to do many of the, of the things that are necessary very often, or that they are struggling with other factors such as unemployment or, or, uh, or employment that does not provide them with opportunities to engage with their children as they would like. Fundamentally, we are concerned about the ways in which we, are, we can support parents and we can support parents to do the best work and to facilitate the learning and the well-being of, of, their, of their children and care for themselves and others at the same time. So I'm going to leave it there um, and eager to hear whatever questions, commentaries, testimonies that others might have. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Gadsden. Um, so just a reminder for those who have just joined us, um, feel free to ask your questions into the chat um, or you can just let us know if you would like for us to read it or if you'd like to read it after all three of our panelists have um, spoken, and then we'll open it up to those questions. So next we'll have uh, Dr. Richardson speak. So Dr. Marcia Richardson is a senior lecturer in Penn GSC School and Mental Health Counseling Program, a clinical psychologist by training and a profess professional program administrator. Her extensive professional experience as a practitioner includes providing clinical and managerial oversight of a school-based mental health program that specializes in the utilization of Nicholas Hobbs and the PP model of care for behaviorally challenged children and adolescents. 
She maintains a small private practice and provides consultative services in professional development, effective communication and program development to independent providers. Great, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm just gonna cut straight to the chase. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Gatson's um, overview of the work and the research that she's done. And it's quite interesting how her work sort of intersects with my focus and my interest. Um, I primarily right now teach in GSE's uh, Master's in Counseling's program where I am educating students to become um, licensed professional counselors as well as school counselors. In addition to that, as um, was indicated, I also have a small private practice. And one of the scary statistics that I share about that work is 90% of my clients uh, to this day are educators, um, particularly educators in the Philadelphia School District. Um, and so I have the opportunity of not only helping um, these individuals navigate um, their personal distress, but I also have, this is a great platform to, to also provide psychoeducational information uh, about the children with whom they work and teach. Um, and so I just have this simple little um, um, picture here about the benefits of counseling. And I oftentimes share with um, the parents that I work with, um, you know, the best way oftentimes to help your children is to get the help for yourself first. You know, that, that old saying where if you're on a plane and the oxygen dips, you know, put the mask on yourself before you help someone else. And I'm a real strong believer in that. Um, I see it in the teachers, I see it in the, the parents that I work with, you know, taking care of themselves um, is oftentimes the best way uh, to help their children. Um, some of the projects that I'm doing in addition to my private practice is I am a facilitator in an organization called Speak Up, which is a phenomenal um, small organization out in the suburbs of PA where they develop these small group conversations between educators, parents, and students. Um, and it's a, it's a great venue for students to share what's on their mind related to mental health issues, stress, drugs and alcohol, um, sex, you name it. Um, and it's a, it's a very nice uh, environment um, to share in a non-judgmental um, atmosphere. Um, I also do a lot of professional development training and workshops, uh, particularly for um, individuals who are preparing to become teachers. So for example, the Regional Noise Scholars is a program that um, has several students from different universities here in the Philadelphia area and actually nationwide now. And I perform or provide uh, workshops on trauma-informed pedagogy, you know, how to um, assess and how to incorporate the knowledge that many of the children that are in the classrooms have significant histories of trauma. Um, and then the impact that that has on the, the ability of teachers to teach and to connect with the students and also recognize that teachers themselves um, may have their own personal experience. And within the organization, you know, several of the districts where our teachers are going um, are also traumatized organizations. So understanding that ecological um, perspective on the work that they do. Um, I also have the pleasure of working with Dr. Howard Stevenson um, and his organization Lion's Story that provides racial literacy to um, educators, um, businesses, um, organizations, community organizations and so forth. And so the intersection of all of this as it relates to um, this picture I have here, again, evolves around self-care. Um, the benefits of counseling is, you know, you don't necessarily have to have major issues that you're experiencing, um, but these are this is an opportunity and a venue to, to share with someone, whether it's individually or within a group, um, to look at such things as mental health related concerns, uh, relationship concerns, whether it's intrapersonal or um, in your own you know, professional endeavors, ways of relieving um, stress, you know, managing it through mindfulness activities, yoga, um, breathing activities. 
um, these are the types of things that are um, often underutilized. Uh, so for example, um, I have a teacher in my practice right now and when she gets overwhelmed, she literally says that she forgets to breathe. Um, and it's not, you know, breathing to survive, it's breathing to thrive. And so sharing with her different techniques on how to do that in the moment, um, which then she can model even for her students. And so as Dr. Gatson talked about ways in which um, systems can help students in all of the key areas such as social emotional, um, physical safety and so forth, um, the techniques and skills that teachers are learning and, and counseling, they can model that in their classroom. So it's like a triple down effect. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out other ways to um, you know, provide this information through a variety of systems in the work that I do both at GSC um, and in my private practice. And so one of the um, you know, lasting comments for you all is, you know, it's really important to focus on self-care. Um, you know, again, can't be much of a great help if you yourself are physically or emotionally compromised um, because it, it does take a lot of work, especially navigating um, all of the different things that are happening in our world around us. So, thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Richardson. Um, and so now, uh, Dr. Stevenson. Dr. Howard Stevenson is the Constance Clayton Professor of Urban Education, Professor of Africana Studies in the Human Development and Quantitative Methods Division of the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the Executive Director of the Racial Empowerment Collaborative designed to promote racial literacy in education, health, and community institutions. His most recent research focuses on helping children and adults de develop and use assertive coping strategies during face-to-face -face microaggressions. Key to this racial healing work is the use of culture to reduce in the moment threat actions and increase access to memory, physical mobility, and voice. So uh, Dr. Stevenson, I'll turn it over to you now. Oh, Dr. Stevenson, I think you're muted. Very good. How about now? That's... Can hear you now. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon, um, for the intro. And it's a it's a delight to be presenting with my colleagues, Dr. Gadsden and Dr. Richardson, and. Um, um, because I think, you know, our different works also blend together um, quite well. Um, part of, if I can get the right screen to share, um, all of our work in, in a nutshell has started um, with a proverb. Um, can you see that? The lion's story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. Are you seeing that or some other? Screen? Yeah, we can see it. We see it. Great. All right. So um, partly that has been a very cultural framing for the work I'm interested in, because I've always been interested in people's stories and particularly racial stories. Um, and in the context of parenting, have been trying to answer a question very basically, you know, does it matter when parents talk to their children about race? And so uh, in the sense that Dr. Gadsden's work uh, it has been, uh, a lot of it has been macro and, and, and that filters down to inter interactions for young people and children. Um, and as Dr. Richardson was describing uh, the benefits of counseling, uh, I've been trying to also um, be even more micro in the sense of uh, what happens in face-to-face -face encounters for young people. And um, you know, one particular the area that I've been most interested in is this notion of racial socialization. You know, the talk as some people think of it. Um, do people give the talk, and if so, why and why not? Um, and when pa parents give the talk, uh, is it useful or helpful? And um, in areas, uh, particularly around academics, but also emotional well-being, and. Um, and I, I think we were the first to ask, you know, teenagers uh, and children, what, what, 
what do your parents say? You can imagine that what parents say they say to children is a little bit different than what children say their parents say to them about race. And, uh, um, and it so happens that whether you look at either direction, what parents are saying or focusing on teenagers, um, it's still a benefit in, in many respects. But um, part of the reason of why parents might talk to children about race or why we need to think about what you do in a situation um, of a racial encounter is that it's very stressful. And if you look at the research on racial moments in these face-to-face -face moments, they affect your body, your thoughts, and your emotions in ways that we don't often appreciate or notice. And so um, while, while it is to be important to be addressing systemic racism, you could argue, um, I would say that the face-to-face the -face encounters matter tremendously um, as the, the kind of conflicts we've seen between police and youth, between teachers and youth, are are face to face, and and the decision making tends to be within a couple of minutes. And so the, the question is, can we develop skill sets to manage the stress of these racial encounters um, in in a few minutes um, because they're both stressful and also threatening. And so. Um, you know, we're interested not just in what happens during the encounter, but also what's going on with your body, your thoughts, and your feelings before a stressful moment uh, that's racial happens, during it, and after. And so the issue of after is the, the effects of unaddressed stress over time that might become traumatic and interfere with our functioning uh, writ large. Um, so if we look at the research, at least on racial socialization, the theory that we proposed of uh, why, if it is helpful, right? Um, and some of that research that's found it to be helpful has found stuff uh, around um, the benefits around cognitive and behavioral competence of preschoolers. Some folks at Johns Hopkins uh, found that those young children who had had some conversations around race had better factual knowledge and problem solving skills. Um, and our work focused on anger management and depression management and found some positive outcomes there. Um, but others have looked at academic achievement, self-esteem, um, uh, much more mature racial identity as, as, a, as a related benefit of talking to young people about race or teenagers saying their parents talk to them a lot about race. Um, in some of our work, we focused on how do we include this stuff into intervention, right? And some of those are parenting interventions. Some of those are face-to-face um, -face behavioral interventions for young people around anger and aggression. Um, we've used basketball courts, martial arts, and, and we've even uh, targeted black male barbers in barbershops around uh, the city of Philadelphia with colleagues, Dr. Loretta Jamont and John Jamont, and demonstrated that not only can black barbers become fantastic counselors and he health educators in this particular case, but they have a style to them that actually is quite, I think, powerful. And um, we found some really positive results in that regard. So the notion that racial socialization is important um, was really early on in the last 30 years. And uh, part of the question is why? And so the theory suggests the reason why um, talking to children about race or receiving messages on being prepared about racial conflicts is that uh, in general, uh, it reduces stress. That is, if I see a racial moment or I find myself in a racial encounter, um, if I've gotten feedback, this is not the first time. I, I am not so overwhelmed. I've had some practice as it were to understand maybe one, this is, I've seen it before, two, this is nearly not about me, it's about the other person all right, and, and three, I can use my voice and I can manage in some respects who I am in this moment. Now, racial socialization has led us to another area of work, which is we're calling racial literacy, um, because the other thing about racial socialization, if the theory is correct, and it's a lot more to work out, that out, is that not only does it reduce one's stress in the moment, it can actually increase one's confidence. So instead of avoiding, you know, fight, flight, or fright reactions to a racial moment, which so many of us in this country have. Um, what if I have the voice to be able to speak to a particular situation as opposed to swallow it? And so if racial socialization is about 
you know, informing and preparing young people about racial politics. Racial literacy is more like boot camp, like Uber preparation and being much more specific in the skill sets development. And so I've defined it as the ability to read, recast and resolve racially stressful encounters where reading is about, do I see a racial moment happening? Can I see the racial elephant in uh, the room? Can I challenge the sense of colorblindness as it were? Um, and be accurate in my interpretation of, oh, this is really what's going on. Some people see these moments, great. Some people don't. And uh, we think we can teach people to read more accurately when a racial experience is happening. Um, and as part of that reading is, do I appraise what's going on as accurately as possible? So reading is kind of fundamental to racial literacy. Recasting is, um, about the ability, once I notice that I am stressed in this particular moment, let's say I'm at it on a scale of one to 10, I, I'm at eight, nine to 10, how do I bring my most, um, I guess, extreme stress or threat reaction uh, downward to a place where it's much more manageable? So recasting is like uh, reframing uh, myself or the other or the situation um, to, to, um, from an impossible frame to one that is more possible. Can I see uh, a positive reframe this moment as not in overwhelming, but just challenging? And, and that is, you know, if I see a racially stressful moment as a threat like facing a, a tsunami, how can I reframe the moment so that I can see this like mountain climbing? Challenging, but not impossible. And the strategy that we use to do that, a uh, mindfulness approach, called CLCBE, stands for Calculate, Locate, Communicate, Breathe, and Exhale, where we're trying to bring the best of, of the science around help, helping folks to notice what's happening in their bodies, the, their thoughts, and their feelings. So calculate is what feelings am I having? And um, how intense are they on a scale from one to 10? Locate is where in my body do I feel the stress? And the more specific I can be, the more I can manage it. Communicate is what self-talk uh, is going on and what images are coming to my mind because that's a form of communication that we're having um, and self-talk is probably the hardest thing to track uh, without practice. And then breathing in four counts very slowly, say through your nose and breathing out even slower through your mouth allows your brain and body to re-correct itself, right? And at, at an eight, nine or 10, your brain and goes on lockdown, you lose peripheral vision and hearing. And basically, if it's a crisis, you're more prepared to protect yourself. But if it's not a crisis or you're distorting a racial encounter as if it is more dangerous than it really is, that's a problem. Um, and so breathing, exhaling helps that. And finally, resolving a racially stressful moment is about do I make a healthy uh, and just decision that matches my social justice value? So instead of underreacting, which is about minimizing what is effect it has on me when it really does have an effect on me. And overreacting is like cursing out everybody, including, including the uh, cat and the dog and the pet hamster, and they had nothing to do with the racial moment. The idea of resolving is, do I uh, make socially just decisions and actions that match my social justice values? So I'm going to stop there. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much for all of that, Dr. Stevenson, and to all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Gadsden, Dr. Richardson as well. Um, so at this point, I will go ahead and open it up to questions. And I see two questions already in the chat. So again, if people would like to ask any question, you can pose it directly to the chat for um, me to read. But if you'd also like to um, read it out yourself, you can just say that in the chat as well. Um, so the first one is from Hannah uh, to Dr. Gatson. So um, is there any research on children of incarcerated mothers or given the high and tragic rate of maternal mortality among African-American women, is there any research around children in impacted families? Ah, great, um, thanks. I think I responded to Hannah as well um, in the chat, but um, oh. I'm uh, <laughs> happy to kind of talk because that may be a question from other people. So um, yes, there is, and, and 
Um, I have to say, I want to thank my wonderful doctoral student, Arya Olua, Olua Badaki, because she, I had a crude, a very crude document and she made it pretty um, for the presentation. She always comes through. Uh, so um, it actually should have been um, children of incarcerated parents because there is um, a smaller body of work on, on, on mothers, but I find it to be an even more compelling body of work because women have been um, the population, women and youth, young um, adolescents, have been the growing um, population in, in, in prisons. And, um, and it's been the work on mothers who are incarcerated um, has been wrought with, I, I find it to be kind of um, judgments um, uh, in a way that the work that um, has focused on fathers um, has not. Um, but there are many programs. The Child Welfare League of America has done a lot of work um, with um, incarcerated mothers, um, and I think it's an it, it's a, an important um, you know body of work. As it turns out, when women when 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 the number of women who were incarcerated increased, they typically ended up in federal prisons. Um, mostly because it was in relationship to partners who may have been doing drugs and they ended up being involved in some way. And um, so the numbers of women um, will be higher in, well, proportionally in federal prison. So an important body of work. Mm -hmm. Want me to answer Hannah's other question? <laughs> since I'm here, Hannah had another question about um, work on children um, and um, uh, I think this is, is Hannah, um, at the border or did I misunderstand that? Um, and I think that was the question. Um, there is a growing, again, a small, a still small body of work, but the Foundation for Child Development and other places have attempted to do this work. Jean Garcia, who's a very well-known researcher in education, um, has um, been particularly interested in, in um, children and families at the border. You know, the issue of children and families at the border, just like many other issues, at least for me, is a moral issue, an ethical issue. Um, and um, the Society for Childhood for um, Research and Child Development um, finally took a stand on these issues because as psychologists, we cannot care about, I mean, we, we would be just um, disadvantages to our, our field not to care, but the humanity, the lack of humanity um, is as important as the research um, that needs to be done. Um, when we think of 500 kids who don't know where their parents are. Um, so that for me is a human issue. It's a, you know, it, it, for me, it's also something that I have some professional expertise to, you know, to, to, to study. But at the end of the day, it's a moral, ethical and human issue. Um, I also see a question for Dr. Stevenson. Um, mm -hmm. So do you see racial literacy boot camp uh, or education effective in the workplace as well? And if so, how could we encourage or uh, engage our colleagues in these approaches? Yes, the answer is yes. And um, as um, Dr. Richardson mentioned in our work with the, the nonprofit line story, we get a chance to um, start with CEOs who actually can make better decisions on how the training gets filtered throughout as, as opposed to starting just with frontline workers or just with students or just with parents or teachers. They, they, um, so in, in one group, the Children's Literary Initiative, I think we had close to 300 folks, maybe 400 staff, where in each unit, there are different politics uh, around race. And so um, now, the, for, for us, for me, the idea of racial literacy is you have to want to do it. This is not sort of like <laughs> recommending folks like, you know, <laughs> in any walk of life to just try out this workshop and you'll be better. Uh, in fact, um, part of the issues that we don't recognize in a conversation around race 
is that many of us aren't called on to actually demonstrate anything. It's more like what we believe. So if I vote for this, ideologically, I sit on this side, there's no real painful uh, commitment that someone has to make behaviorally. So um, for those who are interested in learning, what, they've, what we've learned is that most people get stressed about talking about race, no matter who you are, regardless of your racial background, because most of us have a better skill set on how to avoid this as opposed to engage it. So my dream uh, future and maybe last uh, study will be about having a lab um, with police and teachers and, and all kinds of professionals where we really simply have a training um, where you practice over and over again uh, the situations that most stress you out from your own life experience. We, we have some common examples but that we physiologically monitor how you are managing and learning the skills to say, calculate, locate, communicate, breathe, and exhale. And so that could work with collegial relationships and workspaces. Uh, we've been contacted by the largest uh, defense attorney or public uh, attorney office in New York City, uh, in which they've talked about the difficulty of having dialogues in their own offices. And these are folks who identify themselves as liberal pr progressive freedom fighters on behalf of black and brown people and, and folks who are, uh, are, are in extreme poverty, but they can't carry on conversations with each other uh, because of their inability to negotiate racial stress and tension. And this is also a generational issue, older lawyers versus younger lawyers, redefining what it means to be socially just. But in all those cases, the ability to practice, right? Most people say, this is just too difficult to do in less than a couple of minutes. And I would say, how long did it take you to like throw a ball or catch a ball or, you know, drop it like it's hot or bend it like Beckham, you know, whatever you learn to do from dancing to, to multiplication, it took time and practice and rehearsal. And for some reason, we don't think we should apply that to how to, to think quickly and make decisions in a healthy direction or socially just direction around race and difference. So the answer I would say is yes, we can, but only if they want to. And then, um, you know, we're not, we're not about changing people's hearts and minds who wanna go, uh, go low. Um, and I see Dr. Uh, Richardson, you've put some chat and also some link into the chat for those of uh, for those who will be watching this recording later. Would you mind speaking a little bit to that? Yeah, I was responding to both Hannah's question about um, you know the impact of you know separation and maternal uh, death, as well as Howard's or Dr. Stevenson's work. And so I put in the link, I mean, I put in the chat, the Lime Story link, which is the, um, the nonprofit that he referenced in his conversation, um, as well as just in general, there's a growing body of, of research related to attachment related issues um, that are, are increasing amongst children who've um, been separated, especially at the border, um, as well as the impact of, of maternal mortality um, in children's parents, so there. Just my two cents. <laughs> I just, can I say one thing, Brandon? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Just um, to follow up with um, both um, Howard and Marcia. Um, in 2015, when we were in um, San Antonio preparing for ERA, one of the things that everyone was telling us, even then, was the ways in which these kids were being separated from their parents, particularly young children, and put in, you know, in various um, places um, and separated from their children. And of course, it mushroomed. It got to be the, the kind of cruelty attached to it has been, um, you know, it's clear um, in, in the past, um, in the past two, two or three years. What has been really interesting to me that goes, um, that's really consistent with this discussion is that the absence of a focus on, uh, on, on that in this election, very few people talked about it um, and yet it came up in such a poignant way um, toward the end. Um, um, 
it's as though you know we don't have the the attention span um, to to worry about these things that will affect disproportionate numbers of um, of, of children. So you know, once again, it's um, as Marcia said. You know, we have we have research over over decades, and um, we have a lot of work going on. But here's where the 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 um, the um, incoherence exists between what we know and the ways in which policies are allowed to, to, mm -hmm. to move forward um, to, to in th that are threats to the well being of, of children mm -hmm. and parents. Vivian, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the work that you're doing. And, you know, I, I loved hearing, hearing about it because something that really resonated for me having. Um, been a director of a foster care agency, you know, tying into the to the conversation about attachment and separation, you know, even if you just look at the research on foster care children and the impact of being separated from their primary caregiver, regardless of the issue of, you know, abuse, neglect, or so forth, how that can greatly impact, um, you know, their relationships, their behavior, their ability to learn, and so we have that body of research, right. you know, magnify that times 10 and you're, you're potentially looking at what is happening to children at the border. Um, so yeah, it's- Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Marcia. Mm -hmm. If I could also throw in, if you, if, um, at, at some of the other work that we do at Forward Promise, it's actually, we talked to, we've, we've funded um, agencies who are working with young people and families uh, at the border. And mm -hmm. the, there's a certain trauma they've also experienced of having to witness that dehumanization that Vivian's describing. Um, and if you go to, to forwardpromise.org, is a webcast where we've interviewed and talked to the leaders of those uh, agencies that have been trying their best to navigate that also during COVID. And, uh, the idea of stress and trauma on on the workers as well as the families is also pretty yeah. pretty sad that again, like you were saying, Vivian, nobody's really paying attention to it. Um, and it's so blatant, right? Uh, you would think in a social media um, blitz that we have that this would be also accessible and visual. Um, so. And that speaks to you know my my concern you know, regarding issues of vicarious trauma. You know, here it is, you know, people who are working um, in those organizations and who are, you know, in direct contact of, you know, their ob observations of what's going on and how deeply impactful that can be um, to their own, you know, way of looking at the world and, and navigating those stressors, even though they might not have incurred them directly they are witnessing what is happening and feel disempowered to affect change. This is really the last thing I'm gonna say <laughs> about this. <laughs> Marsha made me think, Marsha and Howard made me think about it. And that is that, you know, there has, this has happened in so many places and, and it, it's just a reminder of how we see these issues as being located in a particular place as a, to kind of cutting across different spaces, right? So I'm thinking about um, as well, um, uh, Sel Chuck Sirin, who teaches at NYU. And he does work looking at children at the Syrian border. I mean, he actually has been there. He's been collecting, you know, he talks to the kids as they are coming across, you know, the border. And the stories are all kind of similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see these uh, as, um, um, site specific, as opposed to the ways that children develop and the the ways in which trauma affects you know families. And um, there's something to be appreciated from um, learning from from other contexts, but where the problems are shared problems. Mm -hmm. I think Jasmine had a question, which I didn't see, um, about whether um, 
there is work done on custody decisions and the ways in which these decisions come down in mm -hmm. relationship to, to race. And my response was um, that um, to her, I just responded to her directly that, um, you know, there's always been a lot of work done around custody, often by sociologists, um, as a, actually a, just a core work. Not that much of that work has um, historically focused on, on kind of racial disparities um, in, in, in custody. Um, the lawyers actually have written some interesting kind of case commentaries on, on it, but it's it's um, certainly something that the folks in the fatherhood um, effort wanted to know about. And um, there's been a lot of field work on, on, on the ground work in, in this area that um, should and could be ratcheted up to some meaningful um, research because the policy decisions are being made almost in the absence of the research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hannah posed a question in the chat and it's a, it's a really good one. Um, she mentions how she has two young children. I think they're ages um, two and five. Yeah. And so her question is how, how do I talk to my children about these issues and these topics? You know, how do I, you know, share with them what's going on in the world or even, you know, in the immediate area? Um, so that's a great, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my response to that is, you know, looking at it from a developmental perspective, you know, the language that you use, how much information, how much detail do you want to give versus being very general? Um, so, you know, one of the phrases that I oftentimes use in my class is it depends, you know, it depends upon, you know, um, one and foremost, when you look at your own self, assess your own self, what is your emotional capacity um, mm -hmm. and how you convey information and model your emotional responsiveness to that information that you're giving them um, is really important. Um, but yeah, for children that young, I think very broad general strokes as opposed to, um, you know, specific related issues. You know, there, there are bad people in the world versus, you know, he, she, or they are racist. You know, it's like the language that you use is really important. I don't know if that helped. Howard, what, what would you say? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm following right with you, trying to learn actually, because uh, I don't have, uh, five-year-old, two-year-old anymore. Those were just amazingly fun times. But, um, you know, my family upbringing is it started from the time we, we came out of the womb. So different people have different policies. Mm -hmm. I, I like, Vivian, what you said in the beginning, that children are going to filter from parents just as much as possible and, and anything. So um, in addition to what you said, Marsha, I would say, what's going on with you? Like, what's your story? Like, before you decide to do anything, what do you notice? And right in the same way, our image is coming to mind. Like before you give the sex talk, you think about everything that happened to you in your teenage years, and you go, I ain't saying that, right? <laughs> and so the monitoring of yourself as a precursor to what you want to say to your children, mm -hmm. I think is important back to this, the, your own narrative and story um, because children watch us, right? If you think about how do children figure us out, mm -hmm. it's not really through verbal communication. It's really through nonverbal. And that's very early. And so um, as many families as I've seen in therapy, I can always ask the children either, you know, do you know when your mom or dad is stressed or do you know uh, your mom and dad's routine? Mm -hmm. And they are amazing. And the family, the parents are always like, dang, I didn't really realize that mm -hmm. you know exactly when I don't come home at a certain time, what's happening or, or what you're worried about. And I think, um, if we could get a better handle on who we are as we're trying to do this task, we might open up the possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, as a coach of, of three and four year olds in soccer, it's amazing what children will learn, um, but it's still mediated through our belief of what they can handle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our fears intrude upon that. And so um, I'm amazed that some parents will, will have no problem talking to young children about good touch and bad touch. But somehow race is somehow um, off limits because it's way too, too uh, problematic. And um, 
So in talking to children, just finding out what they think about their parents' hesitance to talk about certain things is absolutely hilarious. Um, mm -hmm. So um, in the same vein of developmental approach, I would say, you know, what do you know about your fears? How much are you aware of your fears and how's that communicated? How do you think your children are picking that up that well? And I think too that the, the, the most complicated kind of conversation to have with kids is about race. Um, you know, and as Howard talks about, you know, what were the messages that you were given growing up? You know, I remember as a, you know, child, a biracial child growing up in a predominantly all white neighborhood, it was never a topic of discussion. And so when I walked outside and saw this, you know, residue of a burnt cross on our lawn, it was my dad's, you know, brushing it aside that, oh yeah, it was a small brush fire. And, you know, I put it out and it was in the middle of the night. I didn't think, you know, that it was a racially motivated, you know, violent attack to our family until I was in my mid twenties. And so, you know, the conversations or the lack thereof around these kind of topics is, is really important. And how will that um, translate as your child gets older? You know, what would their level of comfort be? Um, and discussing these things. Um, we are our children's models, like Howard said. I agree completely. Parents matter. And mm -hmm. They simply matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've had I, I, I was reminded real quickly that um, when my oldest was three years old and, my, and Vivian had the chance to escort my oldest son around the world um, at the time, but he, he at three said, Daddy, how come there are no black Santa Clauses on television? And I and I was so excited. I didn't really have an answer. I was just so excited he was watching. And part part of the point is that children also start the conversation, not just us, is another thing to throw out. So. I want to also just put a like um, Howard was on her dissertation committee and as her chair, Wintry Foxworth, who finished our program um, this past spring, actually um, studied. Um, uh, kid children, what, um, five to seven or something like that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. four to seven, about their understandings of the political environment and issues of race. And what the kids said was pretty stunning. Um, so they are paying attention and they need a way to package it, to mediate it so that they could um, go forward. I mean, it was really um, very powerful and, and striking. Um, um, to have them repeat verbatim what had been said um, mm -hmm. in various news accounts that they had watched. I think we're at close to noon. <laughs> so right. Brandon has that look. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. gonna be polite, but I need you to stop talking, please. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I actually, I, I do just wanna give um, a moment for Sean to be able to ask something to add to this conversation specific. Uh, so um, I would, if it's okay with you, I'd like to give Sean that space and then we can wrap up after that. Sure. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the, the answers that our three panelists gave um, was kind of the answer that I expected to the question, but it still causes stress. <laughs> um, just, just to be frank, my, my question specifically was like, um, you know, what do you practically do aside from like faith and prayer um, to reconcile the stress of like the uncertain uh, and the uncontrollable? And I'm speaking um, very specifically from the perspective of a first time parent. Um, you know, my, my daughter is 16 months old and wow. I dread the day where the intersectionality of her identity as a, a black woman, a black girl in America uh, comes to the forefront. Um, yeah, and so there's there's a stress that I'm feeling as a parent um, where, like Dr. Gatson, like you, you said um, from the very beginning, how important um, parents are um, and not just directly, but like the people that we put our children around. So like my wife and I are very cognizant of that. Like we're gonna try to put our daughter in as safe of an environment as possible but you can't protect your child from everything. Um, so to that point, like Doc Howard, you mentioned like, you know, preparing your children, like when do you have the talk? Um, and I know my daughter well. Um, I know that 
like when her heart hurts, her bottom lip curls, right? When she has like, like her, her physical pain cry is an open mouth thing, but her emotional pain cry is like a bottom lip curl thing. I don't know whether the first racial interaction is gonna take place in her Montessori school, or if she's a little bit older, you know, in, in kindergarten or first, like, I don't know when that happens, but the first day that she comes home and that bottom lip curls because of something that, you know, somebody said or did to her because she's black and or a girl. Um, I just don't know how I'm going to respond to that initial interaction. Um, yeah, and that's just, that's just hard to reconcile. Um, and then the last, the last thought, uh, Dr. Marsha, just, you know, with your, the benefits of like counseling and like, um, you know, healing, uh, resolving trauma, building self-esteem, healthy relationships. Um, you know, I feel like well-equipped to counsel my daughter if and when, you know, that happens, but I'm also uncertain of if a particular racial interaction may be triggering for me. Like if she goes through something that I'm unprepared to counsel her through because it like opens up this can of worms from something that I may have experienced when I was at a similar age. So that's my roundabout way of saying like, the more that I think about it, the more my stress levels increase because there are so many things that are like out of my control. So it's like, how do you, how do you handle the stress of the things that you're not in control of as as veteran parents um, who probably run through that gamut uh, a thousand times. <laughs> well, my first response is, uh, we wrote, I wrote in a book once, parenting is a lifelong acquaintance with helplessness. Mm -hmm. So frankly, you're in, you are definitely in the right boat and doesn't go away. Um, but uh, the word trigger stood out and I'll let my colleagues speak. The, just, just say what you're feeling because you know her bottom lip, she also knows you. Mm -hmm. And she will know you more. And the question is, do you want to give an answer to that and explain it in more detail rather than let her try to figure out what that means for daddy? So if daddy's confused, say daddy's confused. If daddy is sad, daddy's not sure. That's all important because, you know, as therapists, we want, like psychologists, whatever, we want children to be able to say what's really going on with them in order to do something about it. That you can manage. You can't manage the, tr the crazy outside. But you can manage speaking up about it, knowing how it affects you and doing something about those effects. Mm -hmm. And you sharing what's going on with you is a big, big step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> All of that. I agree entirely. It's, um, you, can, you can think you know, <laughs> how you're going to respond, but um, I, I, I love the idea of um, just putting yourself as a parent in, in the space of uncertainty because it's a, it's a message to your child as well that uh, the certainty of life is that it's very uncertain. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm going to, I have actually another call um, but I want to say how I just want to thank Brandon and Jessica and everyone and all of you for coming. Um, I have an email. It's easy. Vivian G at UPenn. I'm sure Howard and Marsha share theirs as well. And I'm happy to talk about these issues further. And, um, and I just hope that during these really difficult times um, um, that um, we can find a place of hope and peace and that um, we can take care of ourselves and take care of the others whom we love. So I wish all of you well and um, yeah. take care. So. I think that was said perfectly. So thank you so much for everyone for coming. And again, to the panelists, uh, Dr. Stevenson, Dr. Richardson, Dr. Gatson for coming and take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care.